Okay, hi, I am Brian Cardell. I'm developer advocate at Egalia. And I'm Eric Meyer, also developer advocate at Egalia. And uh, today we have another guest on our show. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. My name is Stephen Shankland. I'm a principal writer for CNET, and I cover all kinds of technology issues, stuff that's coming down the pike, quantum computers, drone delivery, microprocessor manufacturing, and uh, internet infrastructure, web browsers, really a lot of things that just capture my attention. You wrote recently an article called The Secret Life of the 500 Plus Cables That Run the Internet. Yes. It was such a great read that uh, I wanted to reach out and invite you to come on because I feel like there is actually, I mean, first of all, it's just very interesting, but I feel like there's also a lot of interesting overlap because we're talking about infrastructure and how that gets built and who maintains it and everything. So thanks so much for coming on. Yeah. Happy to be on the uh, podcast. I've been listening to it a little while. I like what you guys are doing. Thanks. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Um, when I brought this up to Eric, he mentioned to me uh, in a much older article. Do you want to? Yeah. So back in 1996, Neil Stevenson, who may be familiar to listeners as uh, author of a number of novels, including Snow Crash, wrote a 42,000 word piece for Wired magazine called Mother Earth Motherboard, which is about undersea cables. At the time, it wasn't 500 plus cables. It's a, a long sort of narrative exploration of the secret life of the, you know, how 50 cables or whatever it was back in 1996. For me, it was interesting to compare not the differences so much as the similarities between what you were saying and what Neil was saying um, about the nature of undersea cables. And what a, what it would be really great is for you to just sort of like describe how does the internet actually run? I think most people think it runs off of satellites, but no. Yeah, it's a very common misconception. The satellites are important, and they're getting more important, but they tend to be more for retail broadband for people in you know, rural environments or people on ships or something like that. So that'll provide one little skinny pipe down to one little terminal. And that's important for you know a lot of people, millions of people. But the subsea cables are really where the bulk of the data goes. Something like 99% of the traffic between continents or to island nations, and there are a lot of those, goes over the subsea cables. So the, the satellites are, are nice and they're useful and they're a good fallback and they're fast to set up. But the subsea cables really do the heavy lifting here. There are 554 of them when I wrote the piece uh, a couple, a few weeks ago, there are 552, a couple more now are on the list. That's, I should say, that's actually in operation and planned over the next couple of years. So there are a lot of them and there's kind of a building surge going on right now because the companies that build them need more of them. And they need more of them because we keep watching more YouTube. Is that basically the deal? <laughs> we need more YouTube, but also a lot of these cables connect data centers. So Things like Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Azure, there are you know fallbacks from one zone to another. So if somebody's business, um, you know, if they want to keep it running and there's a problem in Geography A, then the business picks up from Geography B. So it's not just uh, YouTube videos and emails and TikTok videos and things like that. There's a lot of business data that gets shuttled around here as well. But yeah, video is obviously it a huge piece of it. It's very heavy file formats. A lot of data goes around that's video. From what you're saying, it sounds like the driving factor is redundancy, not streaming or, you know, or, or not delivery so much as it is redundancy. Well, it's, it's both delivery and redundancy really. So uh, the data demands are increasing at something like 40, 50, 60% per year for the companies that operate these cables. So that's, pretty heavy growth to try to, to keep up with. But a lot of the design of the cables is around resilience and redundancy. And, uh, you know, for lots of different reasons, we can get into that obviously later, but these cables are not perfect. They fail, they get cut by fishing equipment and by dragging anchors. And so there is a, you know, a big need for more resilience and for more capacity. Both of those are pushing the, the build out here that's going on right now. So actually, let's start with 
what's in a cable? What is the construction of a cable? Can we say something too about the capacity of the the newest cables? Because that, that's really fascinating. Sure. Yeah. The the, the <laughs> this this happened literally the day I was filing the last version of my story, putting it into my uh, into our publishing system. The top capacity of the cable increased from 250 terabits per second to 400 uh, terabits per second. So it it, wow. it bumped up significantly because a new cable operated by Meta and Microsoft and some other companies came online. So they uh, almost put my story uh, out of date just the day before it was published. So that was kind of entertaining. But yeah, 400 terabytes per second, that's you know 400,000 times faster than fast gigabit broadband at your house if you're lucky enough to have gigabit broadband so this is a lot faster and that uh, the data capacities are going up they're different a uh, lot of research new technologies coming online to push that higher so we'll probably see petabit uh, cables pretty soon um, and then perhaps I, uh, the, lot, the fastest roadmap I saw went up to five petabits wow. per second. So that's, you know, an, an order of magnitude more than what we're looking at right now today. So pretty impressive speeds. You asked what the cables are made of. So at the core are a bundle of fiber optic strands. Fiber optics have been around for decades and the technology continues to improve. The thing that surprised me the most learning about this was that uh, you know, I, I obviously fiber optics are, are good for long haul data transmission. They've been around for a long time. But the problem with um, subsea cables is actually you can't transmit data across an entire ocean just through a single glass strand. You have to boost the signal. So periodically, about maybe every 50 or 100 miles, depends on the cable, you have to put in these sort of bulges that looks like, a, you know, where a a snake ate a, a hamster, a little bulge in the cable <laughs> with the with a repeater, and the repeater boosts the signal. So the innermost layer of the cable is a, a little bundle of strands of fiber optics, maybe eight, maybe 12, 16. We're going to 24 of these little strands. And then there's a you know protective layer of plastic around that. And then there's a little copper sheath. And that copper sheath, its job is to carry high voltage power to all these repeaters. Hmm. And it turns out that, uh, you know, that's really the, the limiting factor for the, for the data, the data, I, you know, I thought, you know, it's fiber optics. It doesn't take much power. You just, why not just put a bunch of more fiber optic strands in there? And the answer is because you're limited by the power that you can send to the repeaters. So that's why we're only at uh, 24 strands right now. Uh, and curiously, the data rates, the most recent in increases in data capacity have been by adding more fiber pairs, but dialing down the speed. So you use your power budget to support more cables that they don't, they don't operate at the peak possible capacity, but they operate a little bit lower, but you can fit more uh, fiber optic strands in there. So there's a lot of work to improve the capacity. Getting back to the, the description, the ingredients of the cable. So you have the fiber optic strands in the middle, then you have a little plastic protection, then you have uh, some metal steel cables around that, which is for strength and protection. Then you have the copper sheath layer to send the power along. And then outside that you have uh, a plastic protective layer. And then this is very curious. Uh, when you actually lay these cables outside that, you have some tar. This is very old protective technology. It's been around for centuries. Yeah. So um, that's the basic ingredient. And one of the things that surprised me, a lot of people think, you know, these cables are going to be, you know, huge, big, fat things, but they're not. They're about the width of a garden hose across the, the central parts of the ocean. They get thicker toward the ends because they're armored there. So they get more steel cabling and more armor sheathing. So they get about as thick as your arm, perhaps, but they're, they're pretty thin. Yeah. Considering... I'm just thinking, so we we made a garden hose and then we strung it across the Pacific Ocean. That's <laughs> yeah. twenty thousand kilometers, yeah. Yeah. So so it sounds like structurally it's not like there's a twenty thousand kilometer fiber optic strand, there's a hundred mile fiber optic strands that go from repeater to repeater. That's right. Still, a hundred mile fiber optic cable. That's kind of an amazing feat of technical engineering all on its own. 
Yeah, it is. And there's a lot of, you know, high tech that goes into this. One of the things that really intrigued me about this story, though, is there's also a lot of low tech that goes into it. I mentioned the the tar coating that's there. Mm-hmm. The ships that lay these cables haven't changed that much. Uh, the The plows that they use to bury the cables toward the shore ends of the cable route. They're these little plows that get dragged behind the ship. Those haven't changed uh, fundamentally in several decades. And uh, one of the most curious things is uh, the, the top U.S. manufacturer and installer of these cables is a company called Subcom, and they evolved from a rope maker. And their their facilities are in a you know a deep water port because their biggest customers in the olden days were people who bought ropes, which was the Navy or other shipping companies. And if they weren't the direct customers, that's how the the rope got shipped somewhere else. So. They're already right there by a deep water port and the the same technology that was used to you know warehouse the ropes now warehouses very expensive fiber optic cables so there's a lot of actually continuity way 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 back to the to the old days uh, the communications cable business itself goes back to the 1850s and of course that was initially with telegraph cables and then later to phone cables but of course now it's all internet data the um an interesting thing from the uh, Neil Stevenson article is about when they laid the first cables in the late 1850s. Um, they really didn't know what they were doing. Uh, it was still very like, we hope this is going to work. And there was a lot of things to figure out. I guess the uh, capacity of some of those early cables was maybe one word per day. <laughs> They were not very good in a whole bunch of ways. And a lot of it had to do with understanding things about the noise, the interference, and the fact that you had this really long cable and the repeaters, like they didn't have those yet. And so the interesting little anecdote here that's mentioned in there is that one of the guys devised like, well, let's just really jam it with a lot of power (laughs) and uh, fried the undersea cable. Um, This is an interesting little stat that it said, as of 1861, some 17,500 kilometers of submarine cable had been laid in various places around the world, of which only about 5,000 kilometers still worked. And that that was yeah, that was all the way back in 1861. So yeah, it was pretty flaky technology back in the old days, and there were a lot of challenges. They one of the ones was figuring out what to protect the cables with. They actually settled on sort of a rubber-like natural material called uh, gutta percha. And that was what was used for some decades before people figured out plastic and polyethylene. So it, it uh, it was pretty hard. The initial days, there were lots of problems. One of the biggest problems actually was just the mechanical difficulties of making a wire. So these guys would they would lay a, a wire from you know mainland France to Sicily or something like that, and partway through, just the weight of the cable pulling down, the weight of the cable that was already laid down on the, the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea was just too heavy, and it would pull down and snap the cable, and they'd have to go back and try again. One of the things that interested me about the history was you know just how persistent the is mostly private sector efforts, just how persistent the entrepreneurs were and. Obviously, there's a huge economic interest to be gained if you can send telegraph signals that get across the Atlantic Ocean or across the English Channel or something like that very fast. That's a big deal compared to sending ships that take two weeks or something like that. So there's a very strong economic incentive, and it was difficult technology. The first transatlantic cable was uh, fired up in 1858. It lasted three months. (laughs) So that was you know, that was a failure in the in the scheme of things, but it laid the way for, you know, it showed people what could be done. More people subscribed to more investments and and uh, another cable showed up and, you know, slowly the technology got more reliable. I'm hoping today's technology is doing better than, you know, you have to lay a cable six or seven times to make it work and it only lasts three months. It is much more like reliable. That. What is the reliability these days? It's kind of a hard question to answer. I will say that the... Um, Overall, about every two or three days, one of these 500 or so cables around the world gets cut. The vast majority of those cuts are from anchor dragging or from fishing equipment that gets tangled up in the subsea cables. 
that's the, the biggest problems. Even though the locations of these cables is mostly pretty well advertised, you still have fishing, sometimes illegal fishing, uh, and you have ships often during storms. They drop anchor to try to ride out a storm. And so even if they know where the cable is, they're anchors will drag over cables and cut them. So it's it's pretty common for these cables to be cut and it's part of the standard operating practice of these uh, you know the companies that that run the cables to contract with somebody they have ships ready to deploy to go out and repair the cables. It's it's part of the standard operating procedure for for these subsea cables. Cuts will happen. I'm kind of curious about like how one goes about repairing an undersea cable. Sure. Well, it's uh, like I say, there are companies dedicated to it. It's it's a tricky business because it's you know usually super high priority for the company that you know who or the the telecommunications company or you know sometimes they're state owned or the private company like Meta, Google, Amazon that are operating the cable. So they'll contract with somebody to fix it. But sometimes there's a backlog, and not all contractors are created equal. So for example. Vietnam early this year had all five of its subsea cables were severed for a while or not operational for a while. And it took months to get them all back online because they weren't in the front of the queue for, for repairs. So it can be, it can be pretty fast or it can, it it can take a while. Uh, Microsoft says on average, it's about two weeks to get it repaired. So the way it gets repaired is they can tell from the properties of the cable where the cut occurred, and they obviously know very precisely where across the ocean floor the cable runs. So they can dispatch a ship to a pretty specific location. And then uh, one of these old low-tech solutions from the maritime industry, a grappler, is uh, sent, sent down on a cable that actually grabs the severed end of the cable and pulls it up. So they pull one severed end of the cable up, and they float it there with buoys. And then they go and they fish up the other end of the severed cable with the same technique. And then they splice in a new stretch of fiber optics. And that's not trivial, obviously. It can be pretty difficult on a <laughs> pitching deck. And, and one of the complications is, obviously, you have to match the characteristics of the existing cable. So it's not just like going to Home Depot and getting a piece of garden hose and splicing it in. It's, uh, you know, it has to be the right equipment. So that's mostly how they do it. Now, although it's complicated, most of the cuts do take place toward the shore ends of the cable. Cuts, you know, in the deep Pacific or something like that are are pretty rare. There are still other problems there, though. You have volcanoes, you have earthquakes, rock slides underwater. Uh, So there are risks even in the middle of the ocean as well. Yeah, it was more of those, those deep ones that I was curious about, but the grappler thing probably works there. I was imagining, like, I mean, I don't, you, you must have to pull it out to fix it, right? Like, yeah, they pull it all the way to the surface to fix it. That indicates there must be a certain amount of slack in the cable, because especially if something is three miles down in the Pacific and you got to float both ends, if there's no slack, they're going to float like nine miles apart, and that's not going to work. No, although you can move the ship while you're pulling it up. So these these guys have pretty precise um, control over the speeds of the ships because they have to. When they're uh, initially laying the cable, they have to be very careful about the rate at which the ship is moving and the cable is being dropped down. And hmm. they, um, you know, sometimes have weights and floats on the cable to control how it drops exactly. So uh, it's, I'm not going to say it's simple, but it's a, a, an understood problem. So when you're splicing in a new patch of cable that's, you know, maybe a few kilometers long. That's why they, you know, put a buoy on one end and then go fetch the other end so that they can, they get that flexibility. So I gave you this statistic that I saw from the nineties when that was quoting something from the late 1800s. Do you have a grip on how much total cable is down there now? Yeah. So the latest statistics, this is from an analyst firm called Telegeography, uh, 870,000 miles. That's 1.4 million kilometers. So there's, there's a lot of cable down there. Yeah, I I had to put that. Big numbers are problematic because they just they're big, right? Yeah, <laughs> you need something to put it in context. So you said eight hundred seventy thousand miles. Um, so for some kind of mental context, the circumference of the Earth is about twenty five thousand miles or forty thousand kilometers. Yeah, and the distance to the Moon is about two hundred forty thousand miles. So this is yeah. to the Moon and back three times. 
So, you know, these are the, the ones in use. That's correct. They have a lifespan of typically about 25 years, and then they become obsolete uh, at some point. Some of them get retrieved once they're at the end of life uh, because there's a lot of copper in there and they can be salvaged. Some of them get contributed to scientific use, uh, various projects. Um hmm can benefit from having even a small amount of data capacity. So some of them stick around, sort of get repurposed. Some of them I'm sure just get discarded and just sit there. They're, they're pretty environmentally benign. So that's not a, a huge problem, but uh, yeah, like I say, a lifespan of about 25 years. One of the reasons actually we're seeing a build out right now is there was a, another big build out back in the early days of the dot com excitement back in the late nineties and early two thousands. And a lot of, fiber optic got deployed around the world. And uh, so there was a surge of that building and now those are coming to their end of life. So that's one of the reasons there's sort of a sprint right now to build new, to, to install new cables. You said earlier that there's a new cable that came online that's owned by Meta and Microsoft. Is that who's deploying cables now? It's just massive tech firms. It's not governments or... Or telecom companies. It, it was... Yeah, it was for a while, telecom companies that were... Yeah, so telecom companies are still involved, for sure. But a lot of them pulled back about 10 years ago. They decided that building cell phone networks was more important and more lucrative. And at the same time, the hyperscalers, the big tech companies, uh, were seeing increasing need for this data. And they didn't want to pay somebody else to do it also, that, you know, who needed to support their profit margin if as long as they were paying tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, they might as well do it themselves. So starting about 10 years ago, uh, I think mostly, I think Google was the first on board, then Meta, Amazon, uh, and Microsoft all joined up. They all are building these cables, operating them themselves. And it's a pretty significant shift in in how it, these cables are funded. And it's because they're the ones who have the the highest data demands. And so it's it's been this gradual shift from the, the telecoms to the hyperscalers. Now the telecom companies are still involved. Often these cables are operated by consortia, by you know groups that join a whole lot of different companies together. Uh, and you know, for example, Meta and Microsoft partner. There's a, a big cable going from France to I think Indonesia. It stops at 19 different countries along the way. It's you know. I, from a from an organizational perspective, it's remarkable. It's it's being built. Just the the number of players involved is huge, but the incentives to be connected are also huge. So although most of it is from the, the most of the new cable uh, expansion is being funded by these tech giants, a lot of it still is involvement from state or private owned telecom companies. But most of it is uh, most of it is the tech giants right now. And what it, what does it cost them to do this? They're very expensive. So a cable, a, a transatlantic cable, which is still popular, even though that's a well-traversed route, there's still uh, more growth there. Transatlantic cable cost about $250 million to $300 million. So uh, trans-Pacific ones obviously are more expensive. They go longer and there are a lot of shorter haul ones that are cheaper. I saw somewhere, I don't know if it was in your post or uh, somewhere else where there was like some estimations about how long it takes to recoup their investment, basically, you know, like when, when, when will the, the thing sort of pay for itself? And uh, that's a big number. And I was surprised. I, I can't remember how long. I think it was not very long, like five years or something like that. I didn't look at the ROI myself, so I, I can't address that specifically. But when they are looking at data increases of 60% per year, then that's a you know pretty strong indicator that you know there's a really heavy need for new cables mm -hmm. and i guess you know that's a lot of their core business a lot of these web services sorts of uh, cloud computing data center to data center connections obviously it makes financial sense for them building the cables in the first place is expensive but also you have to maintain them the operational costs are not insignificant too but i guess the return on investment is obviously the bean counters approve it so so far, they're they're justifiable. And then you said uh, there was a cable running from France to Indonesia, stops at 19 places. You know, when we talk about you know submarine cables and we say things like a oh, transatlantic cable, you know, it's, there's I think there's this view in mind of New York to London and Washington D.C. to London, and then maybe there's one from London to 
Paris or whatever. But one of the things that you wrote about is that it's not just to major metropolitan centers anymore. Yeah, there's been a big change in recent decades, recent last decade in particular. The The nature of the, the network has changed a lot. So yeah, the initial build out was from one major metro area to another major metro area because that was where the, you know, the heaviest data demands were. So yeah, New York to London was a big candidate. But there are several reasons that people have been diversifying it. One is that better data routing technology within the cables has arrived. So you can have cables that have these multiple hops. So you now see cables going north and south along South America, along Africa, the coastlines of Africa. They might stop at some islands. They stop at a whole bunch of different countries on the way. And so instead of being just a point to point connection, we're moving more toward kind of a mesh approach. So it's starting to look like the rest of the internet where you have multiple routes and more redundancy in the network. Mm. Another big change is the push toward geographic diversity. So for example, Hurricane Sandy in 2012 cut 11 of the 12 high capacity cables between the US and Europe. Most of those came out of New York and that was a big you know, wake-up call to the industry. So now the new cables are often coming from somewhere else. Boston, Virginia, South Carolina, a lot go from Florida. Florida is popular for heading toward points south. So the network of cables is becoming more geographically diversified as well as this um, you know, multi, multi-point architecture where a cable will make lots of different hops along the way. The nature of the network is is really changing from sort of a few trunk lines to more of a, a globe spanning uh, series of different connections all over the place. So a lot less hub and spoke and uh, a lot more redundancy. When you have the mesh, you can route around damage. That's right. Actually, they, the, uh, there's a lot of redundancy in the, in the design since the operators know that these cables are going to be cut. They plan for that. And so, for example, different companies will exchange fiber pairs with each other. So one company will uh, have access to a fiber pair on some other company's cable so that if the, you know, the main one goes down, they have some backup capacity elsewhere. And also they build a lot of overhead into each of the cables. So they don't, you know, it might have 400 terabit per second capacity, but they don't run it at that most of the time. So they have a lot of headroom for when something else goes wrong somewhere else in the system. So that's, you know, because there are 550 cables is a lot, but um, it's still, you know, not enough. So they, uh, they build more uh, capacity in the case of fit to, to account for failures. What I think is really fascinating about this is that this is the undersea infrastructure of the internet, right? I mean, like uh, if we were to Thanos blip out half the cables, we would be in big trouble, right? Yes. Because we build them because there's a need, right? And it's it's a lot like highways where if you build more, then use grows and then you have to build more. <laughs> but currently, uh, this is navigating this really fascinating, complex um, gambit of big tech companies and um, telecom companies and even... Um, countries and little telecom companies inside of countries and international waterways. And it's like, it's very, very complex. And yet somehow, like somehow it works. Yeah. There's a big financial incentive to getting it to work. So if you're one of these countries who thinking about, you know, being part of some cable, you might have a lot of bureaucratic issues. You might have uh, you know, territorial water issues, you might have marine sanctuaries and preserves and things like that. But you're also looking at, you know, a potential three to 4% boost in employment when one of these cables drops into your country. And that's a big number or a five to 7% boost in economic activity, your, your GDP goes up when you get one of these connections. So there's a huge incentive to overcoming the difficulties of working with these consortia and the difficulties of, of, of making all the routing decisions. So yeah, it's, it's enormously complicated, but there's a, a powerful incentive and, you know, somebody's putting in a cable and they have the option to drop off in your country or not. You'd think, well, let's, you know, push some levers and, uh, and make it happen. So there's, there's a good reason to have one of these connections. So even though there are 
you know, lots of worries about the reliability of the network. There's been a lot of geopolitical tension that has recently crept into the industry, thanks to uh, Russia and China. But at the same time, there's still, you know, more incentive to be part of the network than to than to be isolated. You talked about that there are these consortia, uh, conglomerate of companies that pay for this and I guess negotiate. Do you know what's the governance of that like? Because when you come to these geopolitical things, I, I imagine it's possible that they could have different feelings, you know, like they could have very different opinions and how, how do they make decisions? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm, I'm not expert in that much detail, so I'm, I'm not sure I can give you a, a, a really rich answer. But for example, um, there was a cable that was being you know put in somewhere in Southeast Asia and HMN Tech, that Huawei spinoff company, was the one that was going to be the contractor. And that got effectively blocked because some of the consortium players said, mm, nope, and that's because of U.S. State Department pressure. So the consortium got rejiggered, and uh, I think it's now Subcom that's laying that cable. So if you have a lot of different companies, different countries involved, government involved, yeah, it's it gets really complicated really fast. And that's you know a barrier to installing these cables. But at the same time, there are multiple cable efforts going on. The U.S. does not influence or control all of them by any stretch of the imagination. So there are still new routes going in and new opportunities to be involved if you're not seen as you know politically compatible with one consortium or if there's some objection you have with another consortium. There are others you can get involved in. So it's not just you know one single cable, one single effort. There are several proceeding in parallel. So there are kind of you know different ways you can participate. But the fundamental primary driving factor in all of this is that there's such a strong incentive to be connected that that overcomes a lot of whatever resistance, bureaucratic, governmental difficulties, cultural problems, permitting problems. At least for now, the incentives outweigh the disincentives. And so people are able to work out their differences. I wonder uh, if it's possible, like in my mind, I can draw parallels to other physical infrastructure. You know, you have electricity. At some point, like governments had to step in and say, like, oh, we, we need to add this program to make sure that electricity can get to all the rural areas and created some really like interesting government things and hybrid things. Can we think about, are there impacts to this? or things where governments need to play a role to almost lobby the big tech companies to please get service for us, like give us good quality? That's a good question. And the answer is yes. These, even the, these cop, even these cables operated by these tech giants, they're typically not exclusive to one particular customer or another. So they will get other partners on board often. France Telecom Orange or somebody like that will will jump in and get a you know a couple of fiber pairs because because this is not just serving the interests of Google or Meta or whoever so there there often are consortia and partnerships even with the big tech giants running the show uh, because there's you know kind of a cooperative interest here I do agree with you that as with you know the electrical grid or the railroad network. It's, it's a maturing industry and it started very wild west. My grandfather on a farm in Ohio, my great grandfather's put in, you know, a local loop telephone network between their farm and the neighbor's farms. And it was, you know, this transformative thing for <laughs> them and their, their neighbors. But now the telecom industry is enormous country spanning operations. Yeah. These, that's, you know, that's the nature of the beast. I think one of the fascinating things about the subsea cables, it is it is by definition global and it's hard to run around some of the, you know, political issues. You you can't avoid it to some degree. You know, if you're in China and you're trying to block Facebook or Google or whatever, things like that that happen at a political level, this is kind of a lower level of the infrastructure. And although there are complications, the connections are still growing. You know, there's some worries that there's move to some splinter net, but so far it's the same old internet, the same old 
um, you know, border gateway protocol, BGP, and all, all those protocols at the low level are still in effect. So even though there are some geopolitical complications, it's still one network out there. I know that with other kinds of physical infrastructure, there were, I'm not sure what they're called, but today they would just be called corporations. Like they're basically corporations that were formed to do this and they would be made up of other companies basically. Right. And maybe some very wealthy individuals or whatever, but those like made a profit somehow, you know, and I'm wondering like, what, what do you know? Like, what is the relationship of those? Like, is there a kind of landlord game here where do they receive something back for being part of this consortium in, in terms of we laid this cable and now somehow like charge rent um, or is that mainly at the, the data centers and the ability to process? I don't have a great answer for that question. I, I would say most of the reason that the tech bigs are installing these cables is for their own data needs. So they're not seeing it as an opportunity to, to gouge other people or to get them to be dependent on their infrastructure. It's because they themselves have to get the data from one data center to another ASAP. I, I suspect that there are lots of you know, inter-organizational complexities at play with the partnerships and the consortia and the data sharing. But, you know, fundamentally, this is, I think, you know, more lots of big data wholesalers working with each other, not sort of retail uh, small bit players who are trying to get a piece of the action. Now, I'm you know, I'm sure there are lots of situations where some relatively small country is trying to get a piece of the action and they might not have as much influence or sway as they would like to have. I think twas ever thus, you know, the big players get to have more say in what happens with the routing and the operation and the, all, all those technology decisions. So, you know, fundamentally the driving force behind these cables is the tech giants need more capacity and they're buying it for themselves. So this is mostly them buying what they need for their own operations. So I have like another question about this. Like we talked about the end of life of these cables and what happens to them. Do they just stay down there or does somebody come and collect them for the copper or whatever? An interesting part of that is when does it stop being useful enough to the people who are paying for it? And how does that happen with consortium? So this also happens with open source sometimes, right? Where we have a company that gets behind it in a really big way and another company comes along and they, they also get behind it in a fairly significant way and maybe get two or three partners and then lots of other people also contribute. But when you look like, if you look at a pie graph of how much the lion's share is a relatively small number of companies, companies are, they don't last forever. <laughs> they don't keep the current focus and everything forever. And I wonder, like, we're laying a lot of these things with Meta and Google, and those are the ones that I remember. <laughs> um, Amazon and Microsoft. Amazon, Microsoft. Yeah, thank you. And I just wonder, like, what happens if, like, Microsoft says, eh, we're we're kind of done with that. I guess as long as there are people to pay for repairs and the energy going into them, then they continue, right? My guess is, yes, that... Either they could find some substitute uh, benefactor to take over. You know, if you are Google and you're looking at 60% data growth per year and Microsoft says, hey, you know, we're going to bug out of this cable. Um, you know, somebody at Google might say, oh, well, we'll pick up the slack on that one and we'll get the, we'll get the capacity off of that cable. Or, I don't know, TikTok, right? Some, some newcomer that you've never heard of that's just, in, you know, being founded today might have the need for it. So... Because uh, they are expensive to install, and even you know a decade old cable still has very significant capacity. So, my guess is they'd be able to you'd be able to find some other steward to come in and take over. And a lot of them already have a consortium operated ownership structure or some partnership agreements to share capacity. So they don't operate in complete isolation. So it feels very similar in a lot of ways to the open source ecosystem where we have similar drivers and, and shares of things and, and hopes that somebody will pick up if a steward were to drop off. 
Do you see the parallel that I'm trying to draw? Or? Uh, yeah, I guess it's it's not quite such a shared resource uh, or common collective good as you see with open source where, you know, some people put in a, a bunch of labor and then a lot larger population benefits. It's not quite, it doesn't quite have that um, same cooperative ethos, I guess. But I, I think uh, certainly th there is to a certain extent, as I see it, the, the, the parallel is you build a more robust internet, which is, you know, a, it's kind of a commons that everybody can benefit from. And, you know, the more you can assume the internet is going to be there, the more deeply it gets embedded into everything you do, every corner of the, of your life and business and academia and government and everything. So kind of, uh, I, I, I definitely see some interesting, curious cooperation among some, you know, pretty fierce tech technology rivals. And that's always notable to see, um, you know, if you imagine, you know, some of the biggest cloud computing services saying, sure, you, know, you give me some of your capacity, I'll give you some of my capacity. It's a deal. <laughs> it's kind of funny to see that cooperation. But I, I think that, you know, mostly it's it's kind of a more of a crass commercial calculation. But it benefits everybody. Right? Oh, yes, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, we all benefit from having a more robust Internet Foundation, uh, world spanning Internet Foundation. Yeah, I mean that that's really the the interesting thing about infrastructure is that it's it has clear benefits to way more than the people who have the specific economic interest in setting it up in the first place. Yeah, and once you build a uh, you know whatever infrastructure you do, often you get a lot of unanticipated benefits, you know, like uh whatever the military the U.S. military built GPS, their global positioning system for military operations. And now look at how much private sector activity there is because you can know pretty much where you are on the planet by having your phone talk to some satellites. It's remarkably useful infrastructure. The Internet is the same way. So you definitely have you know huge benefit when the Internet spreads to your country. And you know if you look at what happened to Tonga, for example, when the volcanic eruption there a few months ago it knocked that country offline because the eruption severed their subsea cable and there was a big scramble to reconnect it. But, you know, for a long time there, they were really disconnected from the world. And, you know, that's crippling for a little island nation. So you look at the subsea cable infrastructure in general, you know, there's a lot of work to make it reliable and robust so that you don't have those problems and so that you can rely on it globally. Yeah. Interesting little comparison that I have in my mind. <laughs> is that uh, you gave the price of a transatlantic cable in 2023 dollars to be 250 to 300 million. And I was just noting that that's uh, less than the default search deal of Google and Mozilla in 2023. <laughs> wow. so, um, significantly, what a deal. <laughs> yeah, it's always fun to scale those out in terms of uh, monthly revenue of the tech giants or, uh, excuse me, quarterly revenue or profit. Uh, it's a lot of money for most of us, but those guys do their math in the billions and tens of billions and trillions now. Yeah. Yeah. Market cap is pretty scary for some of those companies. It's not like a pocket change lost in the couch, but they have a, they can afford to think and invest on a different scale from most companies. Yeah. Especially when they're sharing it, right? If you're splitting the cost of that transatlantic cable with many companies, what, what a bargain by comparison to the default search deals. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. I was I was fascinated talking to these companies about why it's, you know, in their interest to, to do it. And and uh, it's it's an interesting look into this world, you know, talking to the Google person involved, you know, who oversees theirs, you know, he's got a big console in front of him that shows, you know, double digit cable cuts in, in all the different cables they use and, you know, the status of everything. He's got his fingers on the, the pulse of, of everything. Microsoft is looking at all the geographic diversification issues. They're worried about what happens with climate change and more storms, more cable cuts. There's a lot of work looking into the, to the future of these cables as well. Microsoft, actually, this was an interesting development. Microsoft acquired a startup that's working on hollow core fiber optics. So these fiber optic strands are really skinny. They're about the width of a human hair, but this startup was uh, designing fiber optic cables that has an uh, a hollow core with air at the center of that little strand that uh, the speed of light in air is 47% faster than the speed of light in glass. So that would dramatically 
decrease the latency of communications. And if you can do that, then you know you can connect things that are farther apart. That was an interesting development. Of course, there are lots of efforts to improve the cables themselves with squeezing more fibers in there or, or actually uh, double core fibers. It reminded me of computing change went from single core processors to dual core processors and many multi-core processors. So a lot of the sort of traditional uh, computing industry dynamic is at work. It's very clear to me that you know we're not done with the technology or with the network. It's it's going to be you know sustained investment for many years to come. That's amazing that like the speed of light of different properties is now coming into play. <laughs> like <it's laughs> light over glass, not fast enough. Uh, it's 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 amazing watching the the technology develop. Uh, I, I would just like to throw in there the uh, the geopolitical stuff is is kind of messy. The reason I wrote this article, I've been wanting to write it for five or six years or something like that. I've been interested in this technology, but the reason I wrote it now was initially uh, because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, that uh, the internet infrastructure became politically very sensitive. And so you saw U.S. In internet infrastructure companies pulling back their connections and then with the uh, sabotage of the Nord Stream gas pipeline uh, in the North Sea, you saw allies of uh, Vladimir Putin saying, well, now subsea cables are uh, fair game for military attack. And of course, people have been worried about Taiwan, and which is you know an island nation, and they're very dependent on their, uh, they have a large number of subsea cables with more on the way, but people fear that China would attack them. So it's it's got a, sort of some new uh, new angles beyond just the technology domain. It's become political. And so I'm sure you guys are familiar with the, the U.S. effort to kind of cut off Huawei, the Chinese networking giant. Yeah, well, one of their subsidiaries that got sp spun off, it's called HMN Tech. They build and install fiber optic cables. And right now uh, they're basically being shut out of any U.S. Uh, deal, any any cable that comes to the U.S. Uh, can't be built by HMN Tech. They can't be part of the consortium. And so that, that political pressure is extending to the subsea realm as well. Amazing. Yeah. So it's it's somewhat fraught, but like I say, it's still one big internet. You can still get your data in and out of China. You just might have to hop through some other country along the way. Uh, we, we like to think that the technology is politically neutral and yet never is it never is um i'm curious was there anything that like particularly fascinated you that, that we haven't touched on so far that you discovered in all of this uh we've covered most of the the stuff that interests me i was uh a, a couple little things that jumped out at me one of the fascinating tidbits was in the installation of these cables that can be kind of a surprisingly analog phenomenon so the ships that lay the cables they can carry a few thousand kilometers worth of cables and they coil up in these giant drums, they call them tanks. And of course the cable gets spooled in there, reverse direction from the expected direction of actually laying the cable. Uh, but sometimes they have to change their priorities because maybe they don't have a permit for some particular patch of water or maybe the weather is bad. So they're gonna lay a different stretch first. That's an extremely expensive decision to make because re-spooling one of these cables from one drum to another takes a long time and a lot of work. And if you're doing it in the middle of choppy seas from one ship to another, it's you know really complicated. Uh, so there's actually uh, at Subcom this U.S. company that uh, install these installs these cables on on behalf of the tech giants. They actually have a guy who does it all with string. <laughs> he models it out by hand with string. They said they've they've tried various computer programs that's supposed to be able to you know manage it, but they plan it all out with string. So that, that was kind of entertaining for me. Another piece that uh, of information that uh, really struck me was that uh, climate change and all the melting of the Arctic sea ice. It's possible that pretty soon we're going to get a North Pole subsea cable route leading from Asia to Europe uh, across the North Pole, because obviously right now there's sea ice, you can't get a ship across there. But if you could do that, that would dramatically decrease the communication latency for 
that communication pathway. I thought that was an interesting element that I had not even thought of. I'm, I'm a little leery about that because I'm not sure how you deal with cable cuts because the Arctic sea ice, even, even though it's retreating, it's still pretty significant in the winter. And so I, I don't know exactly how near term that is, but the folks I talked to said, oh no, they're, you know, there's very serious evaluation of that route. So that looks like it'll happen at, at some point. So overall, I, I, you know, even though I'd been looking at this uh, for a few years, I was, I was very interested to actually talk to some of the people involved. It's a fascinating and I think mostly invisible piece of the internet that uh, we obviously all rely on it, all global communication and commerce. It's central to it. And um, uh, it's the build out continues apace because it's, it's getting more important, not less important. Yeah. Really, really fascinating, the whole conversation. I hope you don't mind that I, I peppered you with lots of uh, probably unusual questions. No, that's great. I like it. Yeah, thanks very much for coming on, Stephen. This is a, it's a favorite subject, um, the whole cable thing, and I was really glad to be able to talk to you about it. Yeah, well, I'm glad I finally got to write about it, and I'm glad you guys were interested, and uh, you gave uh, a format where we could talk about it in more than uh, two minutes, so I appreciate that.